God, in these human words which I speak, may there be a word from you, heard in our minds and in our hearts, that we might be made truly alive for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I suppose this is a problem that is being gradually phased out in the digital age, but probably one that most people in the room have experienced. Have you ever gone to your shelf looking for a book or a record and you can see it in your mind's eye? You obviously know that it's there somewhere, but you look and you look and you look and you can't find it to save your life. So you call someone over to help you look and they find it immediately. And when they hand it to you, you instantly realize why you couldn't see it, right? Because you were looking for a red spine, but it turns out it was blue all along. Ever had that happen? The picture in your mind's eye, the one that you were certain of that was guiding your search was wrong which is, of course, a surefire way never to see the thing that you're looking for. And it doesn't just apply to the inconsequential little stuff, like books or records on a shelf, right? How much other stuff, bigger, more important stuff, do we miss because we are seeing through the mind's eye or through our own lenses and assumptions how often do we miss the flowers blooming around us because we're focused on tomorrow's big meeting? Or maybe we miss a gesture of care and kindness, like maybe your spouse cleans the kitchen and loads the dishwasher, but you're focused instead on how you would have done it differently, you know, the right way. So you can't see the gesture of care for what it is, right? There are so many things that we are blind to when we get stuck in our own assumptions, in our own sense of, of rightness, the shaded lenses of our own perspectives and assumptions, right? So enter the Pharisees in today's Gospel reading. We think of this as the story of the man born blind, but I think it's actually a story about the Pharisees' blindness, right, and the neighbor's blindness. Not so much a miracle story as it is a story about the inability of those around to recognize the miracle because of their own blinders. We get two verses on the healing of this blind man and 39 verses on the ensuing controversy um, when the healing doesn't fit into the expectations of those around. And not one person in this story, not even the man's parents, not one person rejoices with him when his sight is restored. No one expresses wonder or joy. No one asks, what is it like to finally see for the first time? They are so perplexed, they are so confounded by the circumstances and, and the way that this healing doesn't fit their understanding, right? And, and so distracted by the scandal of it all, from being healed on the Sabbath to being healed of what they thought was a righteous affliction, right, based in somebody's sin. So scandalized by all of that, that they're unable to rejoice. They're unable to see the glory right in front of them. In other words, what these townspeople, neighbors, and Pharisees thought they knew for certain about God was exactly what kept them blind to the reality of God's grace when it stood there right in front of them. There's a poem by Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai called The Place Where We Are Right that sort of gets at this paradox of being blinded by our certainty. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. 
But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Doubts and loves digging at the hard earth so that a whisper of truth might be planted. It seems counterintuitive, right, that releasing certainty and welcoming doubt could be the very thing that allows us to see. That admitting what we don't know allows us to operate from the softer place of openness and curiosity. It allows us to be receptive and perceptive of God's presence and grace. While the townsfolk and the Pharisees protest and wring their hands and insist that this can't be the miracle that it looks like because of what they know about God and how God operates, while they reject what is right before their eyes, this man whose sight is, is restored says simply, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. One thing I do know. And maybe that one thing is enough, right? While everyone around him was saying this couldn't be, miracles of God aren't performed on the Sabbath, people be born blind must be living out some God-given sin-earned punishment. Right? While everyone else was trying to make sense of this through a framework it just wouldn't fit into, the newly healed man, unhindered by any of that, knows what he knows, right? He knows that he was blind and now he can see and that is a miracle. It is clear as day to him that this must be a gift from God, right? And so without qualms, he says clearly this miracle worker must be a prophet and he becomes one of his disciples. He decides to follow. See, the neighbors, the Pharisees, and, and maybe us too, right, are all viewing this through the eyes of, of righteousness and sin, of piety and deserving, and they just can't make sense of it, right? It doesn't fit, so it can't be what it seems. Meanwhile, Jesus is trying to give us a different framework, right, a new set of lenses, Jesus wants to show us that the sin-focused lens of righteousness and deserving can't make total sense of a world that is also the site of mercy and grace and abundant life and unexpected miracles. Right? And, and ironically and counterintuitively, it is very often the lens that sees things through righteousness that blinds us to that grace and that glory all around us. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. So the question is, what do we need to let go of that is blinding us, that is crowding out God's grace and glory from our field of vision? What is blinding us to the miracles and the goodness and the occasions for joy that are right before us? Is it the delusion that with understanding comes control? Or the illusion that we can understand more than we can? Is it the frankly absurd sense that all the good things that have come to us we somehow deserve and the equally absurd opposite that people without must have also done something to deserve it? What parameters of righteousness and rectitude prevent us from recognizing God's freewheeling grace when it comes through right in front of us? What stubborn assumptions about where and why and how God operates keep us blind to God's truth sprouting up in unexpected places? 
You know, whether a dandelion growing from a crack in the sidewalk is a nuisance weed or an unexpected gift is all a matter of perspective, right? Are we willing to let ourselves be surprised by God? Notice that at the end of the passage today, it's the Pharisees' insistence that they see things clearly that Jesus so roundly condemns, right? If you were blind, you would not have sinned, but now that you say, we see, your sin remains. In other words, it's your insistence on your rightness, your unwillingness to be taught, your certainty that yours is the clearest and truest vision, your hubris in your own knowledge. It is those things that disconnect you from God and from your neighbor, right? Those things are what render you blind to the miracles right in front of you. When we understand the limitations of our own vision and knowledge, on the other hand, when we're, when we're willing to admit that we can only see things from our own limited perspective, and so are therefore blind to a whole host of other things, when we are on the lookout for the glorious grace and mercy all around us, in that posture, we have eyes to see, right? And we have, we have the opportunity to be surprised by God, to find miracles right at our feet. One of the most dangerous, probably, one of the most barren spiritual places we can occupy is certainty, right? Is this idea that we see it all clearly or that we ever possibly even could. It's a comforting idea, right? And even a worthy desire, right? To understand God and to put all the pieces into one coherent puzzle, but God is just too big for that. And I consider that a warning to myself too, right? As, as a theologian and as a person who really loves that sort of thing, there's nothing more delicious than clarity and the logical coherence of ideas, right? The if-then about God and faith and life in the world. But I also know that focus on the, the beautiful logic of a belief system very quickly creates blindness. Right? Because life is just messier than that, and God meets us right in the middle of the mess. All right? Expectations be damned. And if I'm not careful, if you aren't, if these Pharisees and the townspeople aren't, it's all too easy to miss the pieces that don't fit into our neat and beautiful and orderly systems. We'll miss the miracles altogether. Right? And after all, what is a miracle but something that defies our logic and understanding, that doesn't fit into those systems of belief by definition? So instead, we are invited to befriend our blind spots, right? We all have them. We're invited to make peace with our blindness, make peace with how little we know. We can understand it as an opportunity to learn something new, to encounter God in a new way, right? And we can let blind spots be bridges to one another and to God, right? Because in our blind spots, we also have to acknowledge our need and our shortcomings and our confusion. We can let those things lead us toward one another and toward the one who, with mud made from his own spit, shows us a new way of seeing. I think our role as a church and as individuals is not so much to tell the world everything we think we know for sure about God. It's the surest way to miss the mark, right? Rather, our role is to tell the world the one thing we do know. That though we may be blind in many ways, many ways, we see God at work in the world. Though I may not understand the how and why of things, I've witnessed miracles. You know, 
We don't need to understand these little glimmers of God so much as we need to proclaim them, right? To bear witness to them, to accept them as gifts. The small miracle of waking up to birdsong, the smile of a loved one, the news that the cancer is in remission, the miracle of feeding our hungry neighbors through nourishing Bethesda, of simply sharing this time and this table together on a Sunday, of the riot of cherry blossoms set to arrive any minute now, or the laughter shared with a friend. Miracles abound. We've seen them, whether they fit into our understanding of what miracles are and how God works or not. So may we trade the hardened soil of our certainty for the supple, fertile ground softened by our willingness to be surprised by grace. That's where God's glory really shines, right? In those places that have been softened by our doubts, by our willingness to be wrong and learn something new, to be surprised. One thing I do know, God's grace and mercy abound, and miracles happen every day, if only we have eyes to see. Amen.